Welcome to the Brooklyn Museum, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Margot cohen Ristorucci, and I'm the coordinator of public programs here at the museum. It is our honor to present this evening's program in partnership with PEN America, an organization whose impact becomes more urgent each day. In this spirit, I am pleased to introduce poet and PEN trustee, Gregory Pardlow, who will share more about the World Voices Festival in tonight's important conversation. Thank you. Hello. So I have this uh, handy guide to the, to the comments, but I've read them in advance and I approve entirely of everything that's here. <laughs> uh, I'm a trustee of PEN America on behalf of over 7,000 writers, translators, editors, and other members of the literary community who belong to PEN. It's our great pleasure to welcome you to the 14th annual Penn World Voices Festival of International Literature. Penn America is an organization that stands at the intersection of literature and human rights to protect open expression at home and abroad. We champion the freedom to write, recognizing the power of the word to transform the world. Our mission is to unite writers and their allies to celebrate creative expression and defend the liberties that make it possible with offices in New York, Los Angeles, and Washington, D.C., and with members in all 50 states, PEN America is the largest of the more than 100 organizations worldwide that make up the PEN International Network. We work to ensure that people everywhere have the freedom to write, to convey information and ideas, to express their views, and to access the views, ideas, and literatures of others. And I wanted to add just to the, uh, to have it in the air, a uh, quote from Baldwin that, um, that I think is pretty important from the fire next time. You write in order to change the world. If you alter even by a millimeter the way people look at reality, then you can change it. And I, don't, I think we tend to forget how writers are very often idealistic, but certainly speaking from myself, very idealistic people. I actually believe in the power of the language to, to change the world. In the face of unprecedented threats to basic human rights at home and abroad, your support is more important than ever in protecting freedom of expression and a free press. And we know how important that is. Please consider becoming a, a member of PEN America, giving an annual gift, or attending our literary gala on May 22nd which will honor Stephen King uh, and campaign for two journalists imprisoned in Myanmar for exposing a massacre in a Rohingya village. For more information about the ways you can get involved with Penn, take a look at our website, penn.org. The lineup for this year's festival is extraordinary. Hillary Rodden Clinton, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, Ros Roxane Gay, Masha Gessen, Hassan Minaj, Colson Whitehead, the list goes on. Uh, the, subjects that, the subjects addressed could not be more pressing. Where do we go from here, for example? Us two, handmade in America, art and activism, borders of our imagination, reflections on violence, and more. I'd like to thank the sponsors, supporters, and volunteers who make the Pen World Voices Festival possible. Thank you all for coming today, and thank you to our guests for agreeing to take part in what promises to be a wonderful event. And it says here, do not congratulate Putin. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, come on now, seriously? You know we're in Brooklyn. So, you're going to make me work tonight, I can see. Let's try it again. Good evening. Good evening. All right, good. Um, good to see you all. I see some familiar faces, even some people that I know from way back, like, five years ago when I was in college. Um, <laughs> and we are very fortunate to have uh, two really dynamic guests here for this conversation. And so uh, what will happen is I'm going to introduce them and then I'm going to contextualize the conversation a little bit and then we will uh, get into our discussion. Here's the, the rub though. So I left uh, Nicole's bio uh, in the green room so we, this is going from memory, what I know about Nicole's, almost like. Oh, 
And I could get wrong. I, I, I will not tell anything about that party that night when we like the liquor with all that. No, I, I won't tell that story. <clears throat> Gregory Pardlow's collection, Digest, uh, published by Four Way Books, won the 2015 Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. His other honors include fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and the New York Foundation for the Arts. His first collection, Totem, was selected by Brenda Hillman for the APR Hanukman Prize in 2007. He's also the author of Air Traffic, a memoir and essays. Uh, is that forthcoming, actually? It's, like, it's out. It's out. No, it's out now, yeah. And Nicole Hannah-Jones is a journalist and an award-winning journalist and one of the uh, most insightful minds of her generation, as journalists uh, and thinkers. Uh, she is, has been a writer at the New York Times Magazine for three years? I see, I got it right, three years. She's originally from Waterloo, Iowa, uh, which I, I was in Iowa. It's okay, I'm good now. <laughs> I was in Iowa, and, uh, and somehow I tweeted about it, and Nicole immediately was texting me like, go to Waterloo. And I was like, I, you know, I can't go to Waterloo. I have to like, go somewhere else. But, uh, and uh, more pressingly, though more crucially, her work has really been groundbreaking and inspiring uh, to her peers in changing the conversation around the issue of segregation. Uh, and uh, almost single-handedly, she's changed the way that this conversation is being had now. And she's also a 2017 recipient of the MacArthur Foundation Fellowship. <laughs> is that good? Okay. My name is Jelani, and I write some stuff too, so. <laughs> Wait, wait. Pulitzer Prize finalist. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a Pulitzer Prize finalist. <laughs> so, you know, Dr. King published this book in 1967. Um, and where do we go from here? Chaos or community? And it, it's, it, it was published at a very particular moment. The book came about at a particular moment. And so I thought that I would start by explaining what he meant by here. And you know, that is you know, the, the modern civil rights movement, the idea we have of you know, this tremendous moment of social reform in the middle of the 20th century uh, is typically told with uh, the Montgomery bus boycott as the beginning or the spark that ignites it. Sometimes people will see Brown versus Board of Education and that decision uh, as the spark that, that really begins uh, the modern civil rights movement. Uh, but historians dispute that. And you know, there are lots of different ideas about when the movement began. But, but reasonably, we would say that this started with the tectonic shifts that came with the end of World War II. Uh, and when we see the kind of staggering and catastrophic consequences uh, of this war, this global conflagration, uh, it changed the social order internationally. It hastened the demise of the system of colonialism. Uh, it uh, inspired the onset of the Cold War. And you know, the demise of the system of colonialism and the uh, beginning of the Cold War had everything to do with the relationship of, of black people to the United States in the 1940s and 1950s. In addition to uh, creating a second wave of the Great Migration, which brought uh, millions of African Americans from the Deep South uh, into the North, the Midwest, uh, and the West, and particularly into industrial centers and cities there, uh, it changed the political polarities uh, because the democratic strongholds of the North, which had largely relied on the support of white ethnics in the North and Southern segregationists were all of a sudden confused about what to do with the growing numbers of black people who were living in what had tra traditionally been uh, democratic voting blocks. And so it has all these kinds of implications, even from locally, when we see Jackie Robinson uh, integrate the Dodgers, uh, it's because the Branch Rickey is looking around and saying, you know, there are a whole lot of Negroes in Brooklyn and none of them are coming to these games. And it has everything to do with demographics. And so in addition to this, uh, we, see the dynamics of um, people being clear, becoming increasingly clear, that you cannot ask uh, the 
hundreds of thousands of black men who fought in World War II to do so and then return to a Jim Crow society that is always a very difficult thing. And so the onset of the uh, civil rights movement and what happens, the context in which Dr. King emerges in Montgomery, um, specifically hastened by the existence of largely female leadership in Montgomery, which is the other part that we don't talk about from uh, you know, Joanne Robinson to uh, Rosa Parks who had been arrested uh, previously for refusing to give up her seat uh, on the back of a bus, uh, on, excuse me, on a bus to uh, a white person, uh, that women were instrumental in creating the context in which Dr. King operated and emerged as a 26-year-old. And so in a really stunning period of time, uh, the United States begins to reform the kind of bolt that had been rusted in place by uh, calcified prejudice, racism, uh, white supremacy, and, and capitalism. And it does so uh, aware that everything that happens in Mississippi is used by the Soviet Union to embarrass the United States and the UN. And uh, King, when he writes in his book in 1967, talking about questions of communism and uh, emerging uh, states and you know, the end of colonialism, uh, he is one of the people who actually recognizes the United States vulnerabilities and really uses that Achilles heel against uh, political power. Uh, there's a reason why a Southerner like Lyndon B. Johnson signs the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Some of this was about Johnson's own understanding uh, of the issues. The other part of it was that Johnson was also keenly aware of the global context that the United States was in. And that for the first time in the middle of the 20th century, racism became too expensive a habit for Americans to afford, at least the most overt forms of it. But uh, as we know, uh, the rapid pace of the reforms, the 1957 Civil Rights Act, the 64, the 65 Acts, uh, and the momentum that the movement uh, created had also created a backlash. And by 1967, King was very clearly aware of the headwinds that they were facing. As a matter of fact, uh, just uh, two weeks ago, when uh, Jesse Jackson was talking in Memphis about uh, Dr. King's assassination, he talked about the private conversations that they had where King would tell Jesse that he felt like maybe he had done everything that he could do, that this was the summation, that those civil rights advances were the summation of what he would be able to achieve in his life. And Jesse would try to say, no, we need you to, to keep going. There's more um, that can be done. But King was very attuned uh, to the political tides. And uh, by 1967, he saw the beginnings of what came to full fruition with the populist uh, political candidacy of George Wallace, with the emergence of uh, Richard Nixon and the law and order politics. Uh, in 1966, in Chicago, when they marched in the segregated suburbs, they were protested against by Nazis, and many of the local whites sided with the Nazis. This is just two decades after the end of World War II. And so when we saw Charlottesville, this was not, it was kind of a replay. It wasn't something that didn't have any precedent at all. And King looked at all these things and said, what does this all add up to? And how does the movement uh, go? Where does the movement go from here? Internally, you know, he was criticized by the younger generation of activists, almost all of whom had been born after World War II. There's a real stark divide between the generation of leadership that was born prior to the war and those who were born after the war. And they were much more uh, overtly radical and militant by some definitions and critical of King and people who thought that King was too moderate for the moment that he was living in. And so besieged by a growing white backlash and criticized internally uh, within the movement for being the belief that he was too moderate and even at 39 years old, believing that he was too old to effectively lead the movement, King finds himself at a crossroads. And it's at that point that he goes to Jamaica for six weeks um, some of the time with Coretta Scott, some of the time he's there alone, uh, and begins to try to elucidate uh, his ideas on where the movement is 
and what the prerogatives are and what it, what it must do next. So I, I wanna begin with you by asking a simple question. So Dr. King said, uh, where do we go from here? Where did we go from there? Show me out, okay. Well, um, thinking about it from the perspective of, of literature, uh, as you point out, he was wary of the younger generations and I think there was a, a kind of um, where he was, had this integrationist mindset. I think the black arts movement, which came of age, so to speak, in that uh, around 67, 72, um, I think the, the value system of the black arts movement was much more interior, was much more, uh, they, they thought about blackness in a way that was more essential. Um, and that was to the exclusion of white writers. And so the, the, the integrationist way of thinking, uh, I think it lost a lot of ground in that moment. Um, yeah. That was succinct. Um, <laughs> I'll come I mean, back to this. Where we went from there, I think, is where if you look at history, we always go after periods of of uh, civil and social unrest, at least, or racial progress, is they're immediately followed by a period of, of retrenchment, which I would say has been ongoing since the election of Nixon until now, really. Um, so Nixon, who runs earlier and gets the shit kicked out of him because he runs really as a moderate, learns the oldest lesson in American history, which is if you really want to win, you run on race. Um, so he comes back and he runs on his law and order platform. He creates the Southern strategy, but the Southern strategy is kind of based on what, uh, or at least people say George Wallace said when he also ran as a moderate yeah, and got his right. ass kicked, mm -hmm. right? Which that he found out that the whole country was the South, mm -hmm. that white racism was an American thing and not a Southern thing. And so you run on racism, you can win the entire country. Mm -hmm. And that's what Nixon does. So the Southern strategy, of course, is a coalition between Southern white people and ethnic white people in the North who are, who supported the civil rights movement as long as it was targeting the South mm -hmm. and then quickly turn their backs on King and the movement once the movement starts to address racial inequality in the North. Um, and so you see him, I mean, I, I've looked at his papers. He uh, promises them that he will stop forward progress on integration, particularly in schools and housing, which of course are the most mm -hmm. important areas of integration. That's where life is most intimate. That's where opportunities are had. Um, and you start to see uh, resegregation. You start to see uh, the end of integration efforts, particularly they never really start in the North. He stops the progress. Michigan votes for George Wallace in the presidential primary. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that's what you saw. What's interesting when we think about the movement is as um, we are passing the most, you know, far sweeping civil rights legislation since the 1860s Civil Rights Acts, Watts goes up in flames, right? Um, you start to see northern communities combusting as black people are getting, you know, rights that they had never had, but these aren't touching any of the cities in the north because Segregation and inequality in the North was not done by law, it was done through housing. Mm -hmm. It was done um, through other policy. And that's when you really started to see the backlash against King. When he comes North, when he starts to lose his white support, it's because he's no longer talking. I think you really saw the limitations of the civil rights movement, which was trying to challenge laws. And once you've changed the laws, if you don't now enforce what? them, you haven't right. actually changed the fundamental way that white people think and interact with black people. Um, <clears throat> you can see this all across the South as you see uh, the Voting Rights Act leading to elections of large numbers of black folks, but it hasn't fundamentally changed that, the economic condition of black people, which King is now arguing for economic redistri redistribution of wealth. Um, and I think we lead up to, so you, you go from Nixon, then you get to Reagan, who is further rolling back uh, many of the gains of the civil rights movement, both in housing and schools and across other areas. Um, Clinton, who. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, 
and then you get you you see the same thing with the election of, of Obama, right? Is that you you see this idea at least of progress where you have a black person in the highest office of the land that's immediately then followed by another backlash, um, which I think right now we're in a period that I would probably call the second Nadir. Um, mm -hmm. I think we're very close to that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's what we saw. We we certainly didn't see community, and if you read. Uh, King's later works. I, I've been looking at a speech he gave in Gross Point, Michigan in 19, it was like mm -hmm. 1968, one of the last speeches mm -hmm. that he gave. Um, he's come to believe that you actually aren't going to be able to change white people. Mm -hmm. And so fundamentally, where does a movement mm -hmm. go for civil rights when um, you didn't have white Americans who don't really want equality? You know, there's this interesting point about that because uh, in, in, in a few places in this book, King actually it comes as close as, as, as close as he ever comes to saying, look, I'm the good alternative. That, you know, the people, he actually says that, you know, uh, you know nonviolence is not, uh, is not an infinite res reservoir of nonviolence and that uh, people will change. When he's talking about, you know, black power, but the other part of it is that he seems uh, weary and not pessimistic, but certainly it's a very weathered optimism. He's skeptical about what will actually be um, achieved. And it was, what was notable to me about this was that it reminded me of Du Bois, who uh, Du Bois at, at age 25 uh, writes that he is going to spend the rest of his life fighting uh, on behalf of, of black people. He writes that in his diary. He spends seven decades doing that. And by 93, he's just like, are we being live streamed? All right, well, you know, whatever. By 93, he's like, fuck it. These people are never gonna change. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's why he goes to Ghana. You know, he's just, he's like, white America is terminally addicted to white supremacy. And uh, I think that was the kind of depressing part of it. But I think the one thing that I think that is probably um, noteworthy is that he does present, King does present one possible hope here. And he talks about the idea of there being economic reform, of there being uh, blacks and whites who gather together around the common uh, ways that the system is exploiting them, uh, that there has to be, you know, the, the seeds of what we see in the Poor People's Campaign uh, come out of this book. And I guess I wonder, uh, having looked at the reemergence of this idea in 2016, like, how does that play itself out? Like, how did that, how did that work out for him? Let's look to history again. <laughs> <laughs> this shit never works out for us in the end. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you know this, you see these, these movements throughout history. I mean, I can't tell you how many Bernie bros I still get in my timeline who want to talk about like the class, you know, if we can just, if we just stop talking about race and just work on the class issue. But when you're a poor white person, we're a white person period, like whiteness is your greatest, right? That is your greatest asset. Mm -hmm. And there have been times, I mean, I wrote about this right after the election of Trump where like all these white journalists were saying, see, it couldn't have been about race because look at all these white people voted for Obama at mm -hmm. one point. But there's always been a, you know, white people have always been willing to like vote um, or, or put their lot with black folks when they saw it as their vested interest. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. as soon as it's no longer their vested interest, they no longer do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's always been the problem. Uh, you can look at this all through history. You can look at, you know, the, the fusion party in North Carolina, right? right? Which is, you, which is, right. Which leads to the, like, the only coup that's right. known to have happened on, like, American soil. So, um, so this th is, a, is a <laughs> kind of quick historical aside. In the 1890s in North Carolina, blacks and whites united to create a political movement that swept all of the seats in North Carolina. They uh, won all these seats in the 1894 election uh, and put the segregationist, white nationalist, Democratic Party, uh, they had, I think, 27 seats in the legislature to like 140 um, to this interracial coalition. And the result of that was a mass riot in 1898 that physically removed 
the fusionist party from power. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's literally the only known coup on American soil. Right. Right. And then it's not that afterwards the white people are like, no, that's wrong. We're going to take this back. They quickly fall into line mm -hmm. um, and race becomes once again, you know, the priority. So I, I think it would be nice to believe that we could form this coalition where um, we believe that white people are voting in their best interests on for economic reasons, but whiteness, voting for whiteness is in the best interest of white people, and mm -hmm. that's why they continue to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I just don't know how that changes. Mm. I mentioned that um, writers are idealistic and we believe in that the language can actually change the world. What do you think about the, the idea that we can challenge the, the fundamental belief in race, like the, the discursive structure of race? That's not going <laughs> to... <laughs> because, I mean, I'm listening to, you know, we talk about white people do this and, and black people do that, and yeah, and, but, and sociology is not literature, but... I think one of the things that King was interested in is the was the just the 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 as I say discursive structure of race, the idea that uh, there is this categorizing, this organizing principle. He's you still looking at me. Yeah. <laughs> that there is this organizing pr principle, and that maybe there is uh, another Achilles' heel. There is another way of of uh, dismantling this rhetorical structure through, through language. To Gregory's point, this is uh, Dr. King's exact phrasing of, of what you were saying. It says, racism is a tenacious evil, but it is not immutable. Millions of underprivileged whites are in the process of considering the contradiction between segregation and economic progress. White supremacy can feed their egos, but not their stomachs. They will not go hungry or forego the affluent society to remain racially ascendant. And how has that worked out? <laughs> I'm the moderator, I don't have to answer. <laughs> so, one, I think we should distinguish between writers and like, I'm, I'm a Absolutely. journalist, right? Mm -hmm. So I take a very practical view of things. I think that you, you, you definitely need people who have optimism because without optimism, I guess we don't fight for better. Um, but I, I, I don't know how you study the history of this country and have optimism that we will ever fix this, right? Like race is both not real and utterly real. Um, I say I write about race from 1619 because you know it, it only takes 12 years after the English landed Jamestown for us to import Africans to be enslaved and to be a cast of citizens um, on their own, which is 140 years before we even decide we're going to become a country. So how we believe that we can purge ourselves of this through literature or any other means outside of probably violent revolution, which I'm not necessarily advocating for. <laughs> um, I, I don't know, I, and, and then it's like, it's not saying we cannot make forward progress, but to me, that black people always have to be expected to be happy with progress and not, not actually expecting right. I'm just not satisfied with that. No, I'm absolutely. Saying there's a Fox News headline that was said. Oh, God. Oh, and at Lord. that point, and at that point, Nicole encouraged the black people in the audience. I, okay, wait. To <laughs> rise For up the record, and I am not advocating the violent in the resurrection, insurrection, <laughs> revolution. <laughs> Dr. <laughs> wait, did y'all hear that? Should I say that one more time? I'm not advocating anything. I'm Nicole Hannah-Jones, and I support this message. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Gregory, you were going to say something. Well, I, I, just, I think about um, King's prioritizing labor, and you know, we can't talk about labor without talking about race. And so when we, we look back to, we hearken to 1619, we hearken to the sort of foundations, where does this idea of race take hold? And, well, okay, so two things. One, slavery was, if uh, many things, but w not the least of which was um, the organizing of labor. And race mm -hmm. was a name for the theft of labor. 
So when we call, we identify this uh, group of workers whose labor we can steal. And then the idea of that group of uh, disposable, exploitable labor becomes ingrained and we start to believe that there's something natural about their subjectivity, their, their being subject. Um, and the other part of this I, I was thinking about is, is the, the demonization. So when in the question, what is racism? There's the, the demonization of, of blackness. At some point, we, we, we lynched women just as often as, or, or, or maybe not as often, but in the, in the same, we demonized women in this very same way you know, through the uh, witch hunts. And I think that the demonizing. I was with you for a second. I thought you were talking about lynching black women. You're, gonna, you're comparing the Salem witch hunts to lynching of no. black folks? No. So, so it's about to get good now. <laughs> Again, I'm thinking about the, the, the mentality, how this uh, discourse is situated in the mind, not its practical ramifications. Can I, can I jump in and, and yeah. rephrase this, actually, mm. before violence breaks out? <laughs> um, but on the other side of this, Nicole, in... 1955, King was put in charge of this burgeoning uh, bus boycott precisely because they expected it to fail. You know, when they say, oh, he was 26 when they put him in charge. It was like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they were like, the new guy, let's put the new guy in charge of this. Um, he was new in town, didn't have deep economic ties. Uh, they couldn't uh, intimidate his extended family and so on, but he succeeded far, far, or they succeeded, far beyond their expectations. Uh, and in subsequent years, confronted the intransigent forces of white supremacy again and again and outmaneuvered them. Uh, pushed for the Democratic Party to have to sign a Civil Rights Act, which was suicide, political suicide, then further suicide in 1965 electoral suicide, at least as far as white voters were concerned, uh, and was pushing harder for this uh, Fair Housing Act toward the end of, their, end of his life. Had he taken that, that standpoint, that view, he would never have, when they said to Montgomery, you should take uh, the leadership of this bus boycott, he would have said, mm, no thank you, I'm just going to sit over here and raise donations for the building fund. Y'all know about the building fund. The black folk know about the building fund. So, had they taken what what standpoint? If he had thought if he had thought that white supremacy was immutable and, and intransigent, is that a question? I, yeah, it's a question. What's the question? Well, the question is like he saw the possibility of of change in 1955. I'm not arguing mm -hmm. that there's not a possibility for change. That's not what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I'm saying will we see equality, will it ever be made right? And I mm -hmm. say no. Mm -hmm. But those are two different things. I mean, clearly, like, my dad was born in Greenwood, Mississippi in 1946. I don't live his life, mm -hmm. right? And my dad didn't live the life of his ancestors who were enslaved. But we can look at the masses of black people in this country and anything that you can measure, we're at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So I would never argue that change is impossible. I wouldn't argue that you don't need um, optimists who believe that we can bring about a different world, but mm -hmm. I'm just the one standing on the sidelines saying, it's not, we're not gonna bring around that world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just think we need to be, I think hope has a place, but I also think being realistic about what can be accomplished, at least mm -hmm. as far as I see. That's all, I'm, that's all that I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. is my, my job as a reporter is to um, report and excavate the world as it is, mm -hmm. and it's other people's jobs to dream about a world that can be better, but mm -hmm. I just see the world as it is. Mm -hmm. I'm not only dreaming about a, a world that can be better, I'm, I'm thinking about how we can alter the ways, the, the Baldwin quote, how we can alter the ways that we perceive our world. And I think my point about the whole demonizing witches thing was at some point we just gave it, people just gave it up. And 
is it possible that that wasn't, there wasn't a political uh, movement to, to facilitate that change. Is it possible, and I think one of the things that, that uh, King was very successful at was debate. That much of what he, um, um, much of his skill was in his ability to communicate ideas that altered the the space in which people operated. Mm. He, I mean, clearly he did. But you also have to look at. So there's a reason the Fair Housing Act is the very last of the civil rights laws to get passed. It doesn't get passed. He has to die mm -hmm. for it to be passed. Mm -hmm. It's the longest longest filibuster in the history of, of our country. Um, you couldn't get northern congressmen who supported every civil rights measure in the South to actually agree to it. A hundred cities are burning. There's literally uh, National Guard standing outside guarding the Capitol building. That is the only reason, because they felt the country was on the brink of revolution, that we passed the Fair Housing Act, which is immediately gutted um, mm -hmm. from any enforcement measures, because that was actually racial, inequality, racial equality and segregation or integration made intimate, right? You don't want to eat with black people. Mm -hmm. You don't want to go to parks with black people. You just keep black people in a ghetto neighborhood and you mm -hmm. live in your white neighborhood and your schools are white and your neighborhood, everything is white. Um, but housing changes all of that. So he had to die. Like he was assassinated when he tried to do that. So I, I guess it's like, you just have to have, and when you look at, I, I gave a speech on King uh, a couple months ago and I was just reading from like all of his writings where he's fed up with white people at the mm -hmm. end, right? Like he, he's not, that writing is not very hopeful at that mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. White people started walking out. I'm mm -hmm. literally just reading his words. And I'm like, you came to hear about Dr. King, but mm -hmm. apparently not mm -hmm. that. Not that mm -hmm. King. King. Not that, not that version, right. Um, I mean, it's also he, the that, majority of white Americans were opposed to him by the time he that, died. Right, that poll in 1966, yeah, two-thirds of, of white Americans were opposed. There's a great image of, him, of right. his funeral, and mm -hmm. somebody did like one of these racial dot images of the funeral to mm -hmm. show you what were the color of the people who attended his funeral. And there was nary a white person in sight, mm -hmm. right? And then they looked at like what were white people saying at the time. They were not all of them clearly, but lots of them were fine with the fact mm -hmm. they didn't like that he was assassinated, but they were fine with the fact that he was gone. That is, that is the America at the end of King's life. Mm -hmm. So yes, he brought about great changes in the law, but fundamentally, as we know, having legal rights does not necessarily bring about equality, mm -hmm. which is why we still struggle with the things that we do today. And when he tried to not just to go beyond legal equality to actual e equality is when he loses his support mm -hmm. and we're still dealing with all of those issues right now. I mean, um, Schools today are as segregated as they were four years after he was killed, mm -hmm. right? Housing segregation in the North, 90% um, of black people would have to move in order to be integrated with white people in this city right now, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the progress has been great in some areas. Uh, look at the wealth gap between black and white folks. Look at the incarceration rate. Like, yes, there was progress, but Again, it's this, it's this feeling that we should always just be happy with a couple crumbs of progress instead of expecting and demanding the full citizenship in the country of our birth, in the country of our grandparents' birth, our great-grandparents' birth, our great-great-grandparents' birth, and like a white American whose family came here last year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, whose family like, came here last year can enjoy more equality than we do. So that's not, it's just, I'm not saying anybody here is saying it's okay, but it's like, I think always this, this note, like this, this desire to focus so much on progress. It is important, but what's more important are, you know, the kids that I'm seeing in Detroit who aren't getting an education at all. Mm -hmm. That's what's important because their conditions look like 1953 America, honestly. Mm -hmm. I spoke at um, Lakeland University in uh, Wisconsin uh, last week, and you know, very often um, institutions, especially institutions of higher education, uh, there's this big conversation around diversity and uh, inclusion and et cetera, et cetera, but uh, very rarely do people want to actually grapple with the institutional histories as to why you don't have diversity in the first place. Um, and so I was there, and people were very polite to me, I should say, I was very polite, very welcoming, um, and I think I then stepped on some toes because I said, uh, I have a father of a good friend who is an alum of this university. He told me about 
uh, a defining experience in his um, education and in his life, which is that uh, he was from Chicago, from uh, south side of Chicago, went to school uh, in very rural Wisconsin. It's very rural now. Um, you know, back then I'm just like imagining, you know, what it was. Uh, and this is a brother in the middle of like an area where there are not very many uh, black people. And he says his uh, uh, spring break of his sophomore year, he is preparing to go home and there's a big uh, kind of roar and there's like a party or something going on in the lobby of his building. Um, and he's a little irritated by it, but he wants to know what's going on. And he comes down uh, and it's all white students and they have just found out that Martin Luther King is dead. And that was how he learned that King had died. Now, the conversation that we have about King now, it's the kind of shrouded in uh, national grief that people immediately recognized the kind of gargantuan loss, you know, America's moral conscience and so on. But it wasn't like that at all. And I wonder, um, if there is a kind of similar effect now, wherein we've looked at, I mean, King is thought of as, uh, you know, is essentially deified because we don't have to talk about the political aspects of him. And I wonder about that now, about the parameters of acceptance. Have we generally shied away from the things that will actually bring change? Those of us who are in positions of, of influence, those of us who have um, you know, some platform who could actually do something to change, to make change. Well, I think just as the language around King has calcified, the language that we use to talk about race has calcified. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the responsibility that I take, the charge that I embrace, is to expand the language, to expand the, the way, the, to expand what is actually sayable. And I think there are viewpoints, there are, uh, there are questions that can be asked about uh, not only how we look at King, but how we look at black history, how we look at American history as, you know, the, the sort of separated sections of, of our history as if they're not the same history. Um, there are questions that we can ask about these things that, that take them out essentially from what I think of as being under glass, you know, so this kind of museum feel to the, the way we talk about race. Um, and I want to expand how we can talk about it. And that is, that necessitates making people this uncomfortable. Where, um, you asked earlier about King as a writer, mm -hmm. and I thought immediately about the his letter from uh, Birmingham, mm -hmm. and in that letter he talks about a creating a productive disturbance in the mind. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, this kind of I don't remember the quote, but it's it's necessary to um, to make people uncomfortable if there is going to be any progress. And like I said, I I absolutely get on the one hand that that there is this world of practical you know, boots on the ground uh, experience. But the platform that I have, the opportunity that I have is on the page. And I'm asking how I can um, get this history out, of, out from under glass and make it, uh, make it less sensitive, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, I think. No, I was just saying. <laughs> <laughs> so right, I'm just <laughs> there is some, I want to change. I want to change gears a little bit for a second, though. Um, just something you mentioned, which is that we have three writers, or we'll say three people who write. Nicole, who like our jobs entail us, you know, putting words on a page or on a screen. Um, and there's, I think, there's a part of King that we don't really engage as much as maybe we should, and that is King as a writer. And uh, when we look at, uh, even, well, Letter from Birmingham is a classic example of it, uh, but even his letters to Coretta, which are amazing, 
you know, in when he uh, talks about um, when he's, being, he's away from her and he writes a letter that says, uh, being away from you is like enduring a year in which there is no spring. I'm just saying, he was smooth. I'm saying. <laughs> I was like, man, I'm going to steal that. <laughs> but I think, what do you take from King the writer and the, and the literary aspect of it? As somebody who, if he never stepped into a pulpit, he would still be someone who we, who we, we, we would read and be impressed by. I think him, like Baldwin, it's very important that he did step into a pulpit because the, the, the logic, the, the arguments, very often take on the contours of a, of a sermon. I mean, there is a, there is a, a, a setup. There is, he's very patient about the, creating the context in which his point can be heard. And I think that's an, so the, the, the pulpit is the important part of it. It's, it's not just that he has this incredible knack that he, can, <laughs> <laughs> that he can turn to. It's that he has the, the he can think through the, anticipating a reader's objections, responses, mm -hmm. perceptions. He's very sensitive to how his words are going to land. And I think that's his, his greatest quality as a writer. Mm -hmm. Nicole? Like, Kings, you've read, I know, you've read, you've read tons of King's work um, in other contexts. You've read lots of King's work that most people don't read. And I wonder if you ever a kind of like the, and the analysis of it, his use of rhetoric, uh, just the skill he deploys in, in presenting his arguments. Yeah, I mean, I think what, what I have always found amazing about his work is one, like how, um, deeply historical, like, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. you can tell mm -hmm. this was a scholarly man, mm -hmm. but also um, while his writing is, is beautiful and you're right, he, he does, he's not just writing, like he's paying attention. Like you look at the way all good writers study writing, what's the, you know, when is he, uh, where is he providing tension? When mm -hmm. is he writing long sentences versus short sentences? Mm -hmm. Like all of the things, you know, how is he building the, the arc of the story that mm -hmm. he's trying to tell, um, but also that, his language was a type of language where whether you are very highly educated mm -hmm. or you know, you're the sharecropper coming in to like join the movement, mm -hmm. you could relate to all mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. um, it. It was not basic language, but it was, it was language that was relatable, um, which is hard to do when you're writing, mm -hmm. right? I mean, when you're someone who has studied, you know, Great Reformation, mm -hmm. and like you have gone to like uh, you know Boston College and and have these degrees, but also are able to write in a way where you never feel, of course, that it's dumbed down, but anyone could could understand it. I think that was what is most amazing, and that's what like any good writer should strive to do: mm -hmm. um, is that your writing is inclusive versus exclusive, which mm -hmm. is what. Was it, I'm I'm trying to remember. I, I think it might have been something I read of yours mm -hmm. where you were. Praising King's um, soundbite, his ability mm -hmm. to "I have mm -hmm. a dream," mm -hmm. and then there was somebody else's. Um, oh man, I'm not. You don't remember what I'm. I might have. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> honestly, the, like the thing about writing on deadlines is that <laughs> seriously, I don't know if this happens to Nicole, uh, but it stays. What you actually said stays in your head for approximately 12 minutes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I've had people come up to me and like, "Brother, you wrote this thing," and I was like. I was just really feeling like what you had to say. I was like, really, what did I say? <laughs> oh, okay, all I know is like I filed and I sent it to my editor. Um, but I do think that is something about, about King's um, succinct yeah. ability to, to convey um, you know, complicated thoughts in these ways. Mm -hmm. Even when we looked at uh, the uh, I Have a Dream speech, which you know, is almost you know, threadbare because it's referenced so much, but you don't get you know, the entirety of what he was doing. One, the part that, you know, he, he basically freestyled, you know, when he's reading the speech and, like, nobody is feeling it. And then it's like when he departs, we all know this, right? That, so the first half of the I Have a Dream speech is terrible. <laughs> it's, like, unreadable. And, you know, I was thinking that King wrote this, like, the night before. Um, he literally did. Uh, and then uh, it's at the point where Odetta shouts, um, tell them about the dream. 
and that's when it's like a freestyle rapper you put on his beat. And King just goes from there, but he is going off the top of his head. And so when he crafts that metaphor about the check and the check having come due, he's doing that off the top of his head. And that's when I was like, okay, this dude is, there are a lot of things, like one of the things I think with historical figures is that we often praise them for the wrong reasons. Um, and with King, like we praise that speech, but not for the right reasons. I think that was the point at which you solidify that you're dealing with a genius. So there's one other thing I want to ask before we um, kind of turn to the audience, uh, which is the question that King, I started with, where did we go from there? Uh, and it's the question that King put to himself in 1967. And your estimation, where do we go or where should we go from here? You want me to give you the side eye? Just playing. <laughs> so where do we go and where should we go are two different things. I think we're going to hell. No, I'm playing. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nicole, Nicole, I love, the thing I love about Nicole is her optimism. <laughs> no one ever invites me to anything to be optimistic. I mean, I'll just... I just think it's going to be more of the same. I, I mean, I think um, we're going to go through some very hard times, particularly for black folks, but for people of color and low-income people and a lot of folks. Um, hopefully, we will then see a period where we see some forward progress again, and then we'll just do what we do in America, and we'll go backwards again. That's, that's what I think. I think um, it's interesting, because I remember I don't know when it was, but it was after the election and we were on a, it was Yumi Tanahazi, we were at uh, Columbia. Mm -hmm. And at that point I was like, Trump's election doesn't mean that much. Shit's always been bad, still gonna be bad. I don't believe that to be true anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I think that what you're seeing with the Justice Department, with the EPA, with HUD, um, there, there are gonna be some very long term effects for what may or may not be a short presidency. And sometimes taking the long view of history is great where I can be like, shit's always been bad, but um, it can clearly be worse. And I think that's, that is what I see in the future is that it is going to take uh, a considerable amount of time to undo the harm that is going to be done uh, in a country that doesn't appear to have much will to do that. I think um, something that uh, ta said to me the night, the morning after the election, um, which I thought was sobering and probably true, is that he said, we will spend the rest of our lives undoing what they're about to do now. <clears throat> you don't sound too optimistic over there yourself, buddy. Yeah. I'm the moderator. <laughs> Optimism is not required of the moderator. I just ask questions. This um, why it's good that you go after me. Now you could bring us back to some okay. hopeful center. I'm just depressed now. <laughs> <laughs> Broke my spirit. <laughs> my job here is done. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think about um, teaching. I, well, so that I, I write and I teach, and the reward that I have, what, what keeps me optimistic, is. Um, having writers, having students, encouraging students to think about race in, in more expansive ways. Um, so I teach writing, obviously, primarily. And one thing I, I, the example I often give is, if I'm in real life encountering a police officer and it's just me and the officer, it is important that I understand that you know, with the history and, and what, is, what can very likely occur and to be sensitive to the possibilities of that, you know, the reality that my, I am actually in danger. If I'm writing a poem, for example, and the only outcome of that poem that I can imagine is that I got my ass beat by the cop, then that's a failure of imagination. And so I think about 
I think about the, the future, the ongoing history of, of our country as a text that we have the full range, the full possibility of imagination in, in crafting. One of the criticisms I have, you bring up Trump, is that this guy doesn't take responsibility for anything. He never says, yeah, I, I screwed up. But isn't up that the point? Isn't that the, what, wasn't that his appeal? Right. Well, like the, so, people, so the here, people who he's appealing to don't want to take responsibility for anything either. Exactly. And, and this is the problem that I'm, that I'm getting mm -hmm. at. I think I want to look at that in, in a classroom setting, right? So not saying go out into the streets and talk about the, the you know, literary theoretical ramifications of, of, of uh, this, these problems. But if we think about it on paper, Trump is just a, a bad character. He's a poorly written character, <laughs> right? And <laughs> he's two-dimensional. He doesn't have any flaws. He, you know, he, he believes himself to be infallible. And no one, you know, if I'm writing a character, that would just be you know, boring. Um, and I think that, that what he encourages is this, this view of, and we hear it all the time, this view of history wherein you know, my family didn't own any slaves or, or my family just got here and worked hard or, and y'all you know, are fucked up in one way or another and y'all did this. So those of you who are keeping track, there are now two shits and two bites <laughs> on this panel discussion. <laughs> or a third as I was quoting. On paper, on, a, on you know, imagining the metaphor of the page now, if we are writing our own characters, if we're writing our, ourselves in the, in, in the future of where, you know, where do we go from here, I would like to see a, a, a national character that embraces its, all of its flaws, right? That is messed up. That, that is fallible, that, is a, a, that, that recognizes the full range of its own humanity, and that takes responsibility for, takes full responsibility for a past that you know, is, is messy and, and shameful and, and painful to look at, but there's also a lot of good shit too, right? I mean, there's a, there's a lot to be, <laughs> I think there's a lot to be proud of. And I think that you know, if we look at it as, again, as, a, as a, a national character, how can we make the national character more than two-dimensional, more than you know, just somebody who wants to deny it their, their past and you know, not take responsibility for anything? So I, I approach it like a, as a... More literary. As a writer, more literary, as a, as a, as a, as a craft mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we have time for some questions. Uh, for those of you who have not uh, climbed to the balcony to hurl yourself off in despair, <laughs> <laughs> there is a microphone on either side where you can uh, come ask a question. There's a reason I'm the only one on stage drinking wine. <laughs> <laughs> In fairness, we did convince you not to bring the bottle. <laughs> yes. Are you ready for me? Yes. Mm -hmm. I very seldomly come to hear intelligent people speak anymore, particularly if they are of color. Ooh. For this reason, handy pandy, in many ways, it's like with Gregory here. He has a lot to say, but he's afraid. He speaks in terms of language. And what I want to ask you is, 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 or say is this I have, don't think I've heard the phrase African American tonight. Have I? Possibly. You said it. Yeah. I don't use the term yeah. myself. Be but. Because it is one of the ties, as far as I am concerned, that keep us 
separated from whatever is next. I have never wanted to be white in my life. I argue with people that tell me that if the Irish can say they're Irish Americans and the this can say, and I say that does not make us, the, to say, go forward. If we are going to use our numbers as black people, how did, did I hear that? I think, then we need to start looking at the advertisements that are on commonly on TV. There is hardly a white totally or black totally couple that you're going to see often. I am a published author. Mm -hmm. can, we, can, we, can we get to your question? Yeah, my question is this. When are we going to let go, those of us that can, of terms that keep us separated from people by our own volition? So, are you saying that af the term African American keeps us separated I from other people? Okay. Does anyone want to respond to that? Somebody feel, was clapping in the back. I do not feel one of them. Mm -hmm. I feel all Americans. Okay. I guess the fundamental question was, does America feel that same way about you? I am. So. Okay. We appreciate that. I, I appreciate that. Okay. So does anyone want to respond to that? Well, I, I will say that I am, I am wary of how deeply ingrained the, the forms of discourse around, and I said, this, I said this a little while ago, the forms of discourse are, um, and that any attempt to expand or move beyond the, the, the terms that we use, we're very committed to um, the, the ways that we talk about race and the ways that we think about race. Um, and to suggest that there are other ways to think about it people tend to respond to that aggressively, right? Because it's, it, it seems like you're, you're asking them to, to give something, a part of their identity up. But I think you're absolutely right that, and again, I, I look at the page, the, the one page place where we can experiment with the ways that we think about ourselves collectively and individually is through revision and multiple drafts and making, you know, being creative in, in how, we, um, how we imagine possibilities and, and what we think is, is the, the capacity of the language, what we think is possible through the language. Okay, 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 thank you. Um, okay, ma'am, I appreciate that, but, we, but there are other people who want to ask questions. Um, you had a question, do you want to respond? I would just say with all due respect that if we stopped using the word African American or black and we never uttered that word for a single day, it would not change for one, nothing, the experience of being black in this country. It just wouldn't. That somehow it is an identity that was placed upon us that somehow if we just no longer said we were black, people wouldn't treat us like we were black. I, I just, it's, I mean, I don't want to be disrespectful to you, but I, it's just, it's naive. It just doesn't make sense. Um, we were called Negro, we were called color, we were called black, we were called African American, but what was always true was if you were descended from Africa and they could prove that you had one drop of that, you were discriminated against, you were not allowed to have your dignity, your rights as a citizenship, um, and that doesn't change with language. I, I'm not going to say language doesn't matter, Okay, ma'am. Ma'am, there's nobody in this country more than black people who wish that, like, being called black didn't mean that your life didn't fucking get, like, treated like shit, right? Like, there's not, there's no, there's no one who would love that to be true more than black people. But we didn't create this, and to somehow say that we acknowledge the existence of these facts, and that if we stopped acknowledging this term would change our condition, um, 
we're not the ones who are putting us in this condition. And clearly, black people don't enjoy being second-class citizenship citizens in the country of their birth. So it's, it's, not, it's not just about the language. Um, and and I, I don't know that you actually believe that to be true. I, I, I don't know that you think that if we just called ourselves Americans, suddenly white people would be like, oh yeah, they're just Americans like we are, like that. I don't, I don't think that's what she's saying. But, but come on, like. I do, I do want to make sure we on. can get to. You, plus you were scared anyway to say what you really think, so. <laughs> She already, she already checked you, so. <laughs> it was at that point that Nicole encouraged the black people to rise up and commit acts of violence against the white people in the audience. <laughs> this is why I do not get invited into polite places. Like, I'm... Look, Penn look, is like, we will never invite this woman <laughs> anywhere. Sorry, Penn, sorry, sorry. <laughs> We have another question. You clearly haven't so, seen right, let's, before. Let's, let's, I, should, I almost will always say this. Um, when you have a question, please have your internal timer going. I think a, a question should be asked in about 30 seconds. And a question is a, a sentence that has a inflection, <laughs> an inflection at the end. Uh, you know, in, in, <laughs> it was an interrogative sentence. So there should be a request for a response at the end of your... Uh, 30 second time. Thank you so much for this incredible panel. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, to the question, what do we do next or what should we do next, um, whether, there, whether you think there might be too much focus on trying to create um, reasons to basically convince the white population that they have economic interests shared with, with people of color and with black people and with African-American people. Um, and rather we need to think, or whether maybe in addition to that, we need to be talking more about um, white and also as a biracial person, I would say like everyone who's not black, um, just uh, like introspection about anti-blackness and, um, and in, you know, yeah, like, whether that's through literature or that's through um, in more integrated spaces. Uh, and, and I mean that like meaningful integration, not just like having black and white children in a classroom, but having discussion about race in a classroom, whether that we need to move in that direction of having um, more honest conversations about, about race. Mm -hmm. I, I, he was I, just I, talking about this backstage. I, oh, which, which part? What'd I say? Don't make me bust you out. Go ahead. No, you can. You can. It's cool. What? Oh my God. Which part? We had long. We had long conversation backstage. Which part? I remember we talked about wine. <laughs> oh yes. Oh no, I gotta say it. I thought you were gonna say it. You had the call. Oh okay, I did. You're right. So my question backstage was, you know, and I'm here representing Penn, right? Why? Why, why are three black people sitting on stage responsible for having this conversation? <laughs> right, yeah, I'm, um, it's, it, the, the onus is not on. And you know, I, I, I keep going back, there's nothing that can't be answered by James Baldwin, right? And, <laughs> and, his, his letter to his nephew, mm -hmm. he says, you don't have the problem. No matter what anybody tries to tell you, you don't have the problem. And so I, I like your gesture toward introspection. And what I would recommend, and I think rather, and the, the one thing that I do bristle at, Nicole, is, is the, um, is the, the we and, and them. And I think there is a, back to this, the, this idea of, and I, I'm absolutely sensitive to the practical, you know, the reality of the situation. Um, but back to this idea of responsibility, taking responsibility, introspection, um, I think we are, everybody in this room is complicit in the, all of the things that we are talking about. Right, I don't think that, that 
just as an in, in terms of economy, you can't separate out, you know, my Gap shirt from the the people across the world who made it. Right, and we are all interdependent. And so, to your point, I, I think yeah, there's a there's a way of talking about who we are that allows for, uh, that doesn't beg apology, that doesn't demand apology, and that doesn't necessarily, doesn't point fingers or, or, or blame. It says, you know, this is, this is what we're dealing with. How do we address our problem? So, I mean, let me ask this though, right? Go ahead. If you have um, a slave plantation and you have an overseer, and you have a slaveholder, and you have a slave population, do they have the same fucking problem? Oh. You over here cussing too now. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but like, do we, I mean, do we look at this and go like, we all have the same problem? Well, like, let's that, go but, back but, to but, but the person who called the police in Starbucks does not have the same problem as the dudes who were on the rec receiving end of that call. No, and this is why I'm trying to, to distinguish. The question is, where do we go from here, <laughs> right? And there is the, I'm, I, I'm not saying we should not protest. I'm not saying any of the things that we're doing should stop. We should stop doing them. I'm saying there are other avenues of possibility that I don't think we are making productive use of. And so absolutely, and you're right, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to distinguish between the, what is sociology and what is literary. And again, I keep saying my platform, where I feel I can be influential is in the classroom, as we're sitting over a text, as we're thinking about the, the language. And it sounds Pollyanna-ish, but I, I started out saying I believe Sure. As far as we can change the I just, world. I'm just raising that question. Actually, I don't want to go through this whole thing. I want to make sure that people, the other person has a chance to ask her question. Um, but yeah, that was just all I had to ask. <laughs> Hi, thank you. I've um, drafted my question, so hopefully it awesome. comes out as I intended to. Okay. Um, um, so. Go. Uh, thinking about progress and about changing the hearts and minds of white people, um, I've heard a concept that I can't remember who to attribute it to, but that it's hard to hate somebody up close. So the answer to hate is to move closer to get more intimately acquainted. Um, so with the popularity of diverse author. I'm sorry? Do we know who to attribute it to? Brene Brown. Brene Brown, mm -hmm. thank you. Very much. Um, so with the popularity of diverse authors and the recent commercial successes of movies like Moonlight and Get Out and Black Panther, I wonder if you think these are bringing us closer um, and if they're helping us make perceptible progress. The, the one thing that, that <laughs> I'm, still, I'm steady trying to carve out my, my little space here, the one thing I want to push, fortify my position. The one thing I, I do want to push back on is, is the, the idea that again, that we have to change the hearts and minds of white people. I'm not interested in changing the hearts and minds of white people. I'm interested in the conversation that you and I can have right now about who we are, right? And if, we, if we're thinking about, I, I do get very pessimistic and, uh, and, and not so idealistic when I think about how if I consider the problem to be, or the, the challenge to be, changing the hearts and minds of people who I know are reluctant at best to change their hearts and minds, I'm not looking forward to that job, but I, I do think that there's something that we can do in the one-on-one, -on -one, not on the macro scale. So to her question, is. I guess you're saying yes, that culture actually does allow people to come closer? If we talk about it. Mm -hmm. right, and I, so 
No, and I'm actually hearing Nicole in the back of my head now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready for this. <laughs> I think there's a there's a a way that you know we we go to see Black Panther and it it remains at a remove. It remains uh, at, uh, in a distance, and you know. Back to Baldwin, you know everybody's protest novel. We, there's a way that we talk about um, the the atrocities that that happen to black people that just gets absorbed. Like, yeah, that's messed up. Oh, let's let's complain. Let, I'm not gonna use the word complain. Let's say how screwed up it is and feel like there's some progress. I I don't think that element is productive. So I don't know, let me, let me like make a devil's advocate argument for optimism. <laughs> um, like isn't part of like the whole, um, like the problem of, of perspective in art that people of color um, and women spend huge amounts of time consuming art that shows what it's like to be white and male in the world. But people who are white and male, white and or male, are required to spend almost no time consuming art that shows how people of other backgrounds move through the world. But if you have like a, a character like Killmonger or a character like um, T'Challa or uh, the ca characters in Moonlight, whose yeah, um, whose names I don't recall, yeah. but uh, in, in their audiences that are willing to sit down and say, "Okay, I'm going to um, engage with the world from the perspective of this black queer person, uh, or this uh, person who lives in this fictional kingdom uh, that has all of this, you know, fantastic technology," isn't that progress? So. Yes, but who cares? So, <laughs> <laughs> this is my problem, right? I don't know a white person in my circle who has not seen Get Out with no irony whatsoever, but where do they send their kids to school? Right, so we don't have a problem of white people in New York City who enjoy black culture who are willing to buy a movie ticket and, or will come to an event like this so that they can feel a little uncomfortable and a little bad for a few minutes and then go home and they have their absolution. But when it comes down to, I, I, I actually, I don't care about hearts and minds. I care about actions, right? So look at, we have the most segregated school system of a large school system in the entire country in the most progressive, liberal, we love the melting pot of New York, but I won't damn sure put my child in the school with those kids in this neighborhood that I just moved into, yeah. right? So it's, it's not enough. It's, it, listen, when, when King talks about <laughs> integration, what he says is integration is not about some kumbaya, mm -hmm. I have United Nations dinner at my house on Saturday. It is about the sharing of power. Mm -hmm. And the sharing of power means white people who have had an inordinate amount of power and an inordinate amount of resources have to give something up. And if you are not willing to give something up, whether you earned it, didn't earn it, think you earned it, don't think you earned it, is really irrelevant, right? Segregation occurred because segregation was beneficial to white folks. And you didn't have to implement the law to have benefited from that law. So you make a choice. Either you will continue to benefit from it or you will disrupt it and say, I'm going to give some of this unearned privilege back. So no, it's not, art is important, <clears throat> but you know, Frederick Douglass was walking around, giving speeches, and dining with fine white people while most black people were enslaved. It's not good enough to have a black friend or enjoy black art. Are you gonna fundamentally do something to make the society more equal? Will you allow your child in the classroom with all the black and brown poor kids that my daughter sits in a classroom with every day? And the answer, as most of you know, is no. You will not. You will leave here, and you may live in a black neighborhood, but there's not black people from your neighborhood sitting at your kitchen table. 
there's not black people from your neighborhood working at your business, and you certainly aren't putting your kids in those schools. So we, we have to think well beyond the superficial. We just do. And like, the whole mission of my work, and it's interesting, because on the one hand, I'm like, I don't think my work will change anything. But I also feel like what, why I write is I'm not going to be comfortable let us be comfortable with our decisions. I want us to every day have to look at the hypocrisy of who we really are and to say, I say I believe in equality, but I actually do all kinds of things that sustain inequality, and I want us to have to confront that. That's what I see in my writing. I don't think we're going to change. I think you're going to confront and be like, damn, I am a hypocrite, but I'm going to keep on being a hypocrite. <laughs> I mean, I, I do believe that, but I, I think it is my role as a writer and a journalist is to hold up this mirror and force us to actually look and say we are making a choice. And our choice is that we don't actually believe or want equality for black people in this country and so we don't have it. I'm gonna go to this side and so we're gonna try to do like a speed round so we can get the questions and we'll stop here um, for anybody who's online and we'll try to uh, get maybe one person to respond to your, uh, an your question, and so we can get through all of them before we run out of time. <clears throat> uh, good evening, Al. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed this uh, evening. Uh, but to follow up on a point that you touched on um, about the uh, incident at Starbucks and just recently the one that happened at LA Fitness, um, you would think in today's world that you would not have these things still happening. And while I commend the CEO for Starbucks for um, he's going to shut down his business for that one day to give that training to his employees. But what does it say in today's world when you have to shut down your business for one day to give your employees training to treat black people just as human beings? <laughs> That's a rhetorical question. <laughs> It, it kind of is, but, but I think you get my point. What does it say about, you know, you know today's world? I mean, just in the fact, like, oh, take uh, LA Fitness, which I'm a member of. Um, I go there two to three times a week, play racquetball. And my director would go sometimes. All he would have to do is change into his gym clothes while we were at work and walk right into LA Fitness and walk past and they didn't ask him to swipe his badge or anything. I go there two to three times a week. If I try walking past that front desk and not swipe my badge, I get stopped. But mm -hmm. someone who rarely even goes in there, mm -hmm. but just because of the you know, color of his skin, he can just walk right in and no one even question it. That's, that's what it says. I think there are, um, there are serious sociological problems and I think and I, I agree completely I, I identify with that experience but I also tell myself these are very middle-class problems these are not the problems <laughs> <laughs> the day of the Starbucks it, so we describe the the people who are going to go okay? home and, and feel the same way and do the same things. Honestly, that's exactly what I do. I'm no, that okay, story but, doesn't. But, but, okay, Sandra Bland had a degree. But it started going, the same day. It was I going get, to a job, was going to a job I, interview. Tamir Rice lived in a gated community. Again. There are, I mean, no, no, but, gonna, there, but, but, but wait, there are like, these instances of, um, James Blake, the, the tennis player who's above middle class, who was tackled and thrown to the ground. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are, the fact that your middle class doesn't insulate you from the fact that those cops could just as easily have killed them. No, but we're talking about, per, I'm talking about personal responsibility. I can't prevent anybody from doing anything to me. I can't, I can't change any circumstance out in the, in the world Practically, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, as I say, boots on the ground. But I can, if there's anything that I do have power over, it is how I carry myself in the world and how I think about my place in the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Eric Holder, Eric Holder, right? Mm -hmm. Got like 
racially profiled by the police, and he was like the Absolutely. top law enforcement have, man and in the I have been, I have been beat up by cops. So you didn't just carry yourself? What's that? You didn't carry yourself well enough in that circumstance? I'm not, no, that, see, I'm not saying it's a matter of carrying oneself well enough. <sighs> okay, oh, so, I'm just sir, trying to understand. I believe you have a question. Thank you. Uh, so, um, Thank you for the, for the conversation tonight. I have a question around, um, you know, what are we gonna do, right? I mean, I think there is a what centrality. What? Yes, I'm agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, there is something about the centrality of blackness in American history, right? And centrality of the black African-American experience here. Equally important are the experience, and I actually disagree to a certain extent that blackness is the only Oppress history of the United States, right? Certainly and, not. Uh, yeah. Right, right, but yeah. but yeah, yeah, let me let me let me mm -hmm. go um, into it because I think that in our um, in our own as we encounter our own humanities as we work together is actually the liberation of this country, mm -hmm. and I and I wanna I wanna talk I wanna hear a little bit about about either two questions about what is I mean you guys are writers um, what is the narrative that we should be you know, in your best dream, think about, right? Uh, what is the role of BLM in, in this work? What is the role of, of uh, uh, um, Rashad Robinson and others that are doing incredible work, right, in this arena? At the same time, what is, what, how do we should think about shifting power, right? Um, and, as, uh, and, and what do you think is happening on the ground in terms of organizing and changing power dynamics, which I think at the es is essentially that so needs that need to change. How, what is so the it's a narrative question, uh -huh. and, the, and you either can think about a narrative conversation, or either are, are, we, are we tilting the power dynamics in this country, or, or how to dynamics. do it? Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of narrative, like I guess what is the narrative we should be telling about this, about where we are, where we should go? I guess what is the narrative that's empowering to us? For our liberation, right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so how about this? <laughs> um, I'll take moderator's prerogative here. Uh, I think that uh, there are um, groups and organizations in terms of shifting the power dynamic that are uh, attempting to do really important work. And one of them, uh, one of the most interesting things that's happening right now is the poor people's movement that uh, Reverend William Barber <laughs> has spearheaded, they've organized that, that may be around, at this point, uh, 40 states where they have people who are uh, engaged in some sort of uh, response. And it is an attempt to, to change the narrative, to get to your point, of there being uh, uh, one group that is at the, the bottom, and that is like white people, um, and that they are being uh, besieged by uh, Muslims, by Latinos, by blacks, by uh, all these other groups and that their shortcomings uh, in life are a reflection of the, the wrongful deeds of other people. Uh, I think that they have been attempting to change that narrative to say that there are, there's a vast area of common ground uh, in which people can say, well, if we are looking at the minimum wage or the fight for 15 or health care um, or, uh, you know, what is happening with, um, um, the uh, flight of uh, employment options and, and all these things. There's a place in Alabama where there are black people and white people who are uh, suffering ill effects of environmental deregulation that has allowed sewage uh, to, to wind up in their, in their yards, in their, the places where they live. Uh, and so they're trying to create that narrative that says uh, there are some areas where we can work together to achieve change that's mutually beneficial. Um, and you have the last question. Um, since only one person can answer my question, I really want to ask Nicole this. And I ask it from the perspective of a white South African woman of a particular age, last generation, benefited explicitly from apartheid. Can we go anywhere without justice and reparations? I don't, and and, and I, can I just add, in South Africa, I mean, I think we've seen 25 years after the end of apartheid, the failure of the narrative of reconciliation 
And you know, what the Truth Commission did was certainly create a narrative and an understanding of the historical abuses. It's failed to change economic power. It's failed to change the reality of, of black people in the country. So I'm really interested to find out what you think about sort of reparations and, and particularly justice and accountability. Uh, great question. Um, yeah, I think clearly you have to have some sort of economic redistribution um, because it just makes sense. Like it, it, the, the example I give sometimes is like um, if uh, a drug company makes a drug and it kills my loved one, and people always say, like, if you get a check from that drug company, it won't bring your loved one back. Clearly, it won't. But it can, one, replace the economic loss. But also, it's about making things right, right? We understand that you have to make things right. When you look at what Dr. King was, what he was doing leading up to his death, it was a conversation about economic redistribution. I, after... Um, for Freedom Summer, I went, the anniversary of Freedom Summer, I went down to Mississippi. Mississippi has more black elected officials than any place in the country, and the black people there live in abject poverty. It is also the poorest state in the country, and so having political empowerment has not done anything to change the economic condition of black people. And, and I, who was it that said, like, it was Dr. King, right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you have the right to right. go into a cafe if you can't purchase the meal. Right. Having the right doesn't matter without, without money. And in America, we have had neither reconciliation, truth, justice, or reparations. But to, to believe that, one, the way that we're taught slavery, not understanding that the entire reason we have the, one of the wealthiest economies in the country was because of the stolen labor of enslaved people, that uh, black bodies in this country were the largest commodity in the country, that the system of banking, the system of labor, the, the, the cotton that supplies the textile mills that leads to the Industrial Revolution is all being done on black bodies. We come up with a system of insurance because black people are a commodity that needs to be insured. Um, our regional banking system comes up to be, allow people to borrow money to be able to purchase and use enslaved people as collateral. And so when we don't understand that the economy of this country, that we would not be a United States and we would have no industrial revolution, that we would not even have, uh, I mean, Thomas Jefferson studied the system of how can you derive more labor and outcome out of enslaved people and that's how we get our modern day factory system. We don't understand any of that. So. And then that is then followed up by 100 years of quasi-slavery, a system of peonage that forced my relatives to work basically in slavery um, on plantations in the South where they were not paid for their labor. Um, and then say, in 1968, we've given you all your rights, now you're free to compete with the rest of the world. It's illogical. It has produced exactly what we expected it to produce. Um, we were denied. I mean, when you look at ta the case for reparations, what's brilliant about it is he's not even going back to slavery. He's going back to the denial uh, for black Americans of the ability to obtain wealth in the way that most white Americans have obtained wealth, is, which is through housing. So that we can't even have, one, a discussion about slavery, that we cannot acknowledge the harm that was done, not just to people 100 years ago, but the fact that my father was born into a Jim Crow country, um, that we actually, the black people on this stage are the first black people in the history of this country who were born into an America where we had full rights. I'm 42 years old. This is not ancient history. Um, so there, there will never, and I guess this is part of the reason why I say, like we will never have equality because we will never make up for the loss of wealth and the continuing loss of wealth and the continuing ability to take part in the fruits of this country um, because we are never gonna be willing to make payment for what was done. I wanna thank Gregory Pardlow and thank Nicole Hannah-Jones. We have, uh, we're out of time and I wanna thank you all for your participation. Thank you for coming out.